All right, all right. Hey, welcome. Come on in. Um, welcome to each and every person. Hope you guys can find a seat in here. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to do that. Um, but we are excited for all of you who are in-house and those who will watch this later on, uh, on the cameras, uh, on the video sh stream, um, to have an important, important conversation that I believe is at, at the heart of God, and that is um, the beauty of diversity and what that looks like in culture, and in particular what that looks like in the church. And so uh, welcome to each of you. I, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Kevin Shrimper. I'm the pastor here at Crossroads. And uh, it, I'm really excited about what's happening this fall, in, in particular with um, Seapoint uh, Community College, or Seapoint College. And uh, Sarah Hummel uh, is a dear friend, and as a local pastor, excited to come around to support this initiative and to see uh, the vision of Seapoint take shape and take root here in Hampton Roads. And so this is the first uh, lecture series, part of a series of lectures that are going to be taking place this fall. And we start off tonight here at Crossroads Church. So on behalf of our church, we want to welcome each and every one of you to this important conversation. If you'll stand as we uh, worship tonight, I'll pray for us, and we'll uh, dig into all that God has in store for us. Father God, we love you, and we thank you for who you are. We thank you for... The body of Christ, diverse and beautiful. And we pray, Lord, that you would make us one. That was your prayer uh, for your disciples, that you would make us one. But we would understand that in our oneness, um, there's a beautiful diverse, diversity. There's a tapestry that represents who you are in your body. And so tonight, as we lean in, we want to lean into your heart for what it looks like to live as one people under one, uh, under the blood of Christ. Um, that are different, that are unique, that are created beautifully by you and are chasing after your heart. So we welcome your presence and we welcome your spirit to lead us tonight in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let's worship together. Let's fill this room with praise and worship to our great God. Let's join our voices together. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you You are good. Let's proclaim it. You're good. You are good all the time. All the time. You are good. You are good all the time. All the time. You are good. You are good. 
Psalm 100, verse 5, it says, For the Lord is good. His unfailing love or his mercy continues forever. His faithfulness continues to each generation. This is our God we're singing about. I know we're coming to have a conversation that's so important. We also have an opportunity to lift Jehovah's name high, to put place him on the throne where he so rightly deserves to be. So let's sing it again. You are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. That's right. Sing it out. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Oh, Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Yes, you are. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. in this place and in this community and in this nation, God. We just pray that you will get all the glory and all the honor for you alone are worthy, God. I just love that you've drawn your people together on a Wednesday night to lift you high, to lean into what's important to you, what's on your heart, God. And so just pray that just prepare our hearts to receive Prepare our hearts to be filled tonight and then to be poured out to the people around us. God, we love you. I just want to sing this as a prayer. So you make me a bustle. Make me a vessel of your peace. There is war left fighting seas. All that divides us, come reconcile us. Make me a vessel of your peace. That's beautiful. So make me a vessel. Make me a vessel of your love. Hatred breaking up. All creeds and colors bind us together. Make me a vessel of your love. Pour me out. Pour me out. Pour
like a rushing river like a rushing river let mercy flow through my heart to my world like a rushing river let mercy flow to my heart to my world like a rushing river let mercy flow through my heart to my world like a rushing river let mercy flow through my heart to my world pour me out pour me out pour me out wherever i am wherever i go divides us all that divides us come reconcile us make me a vessel of your peace oh God we just thank you thank you for bringing us together we thank you for uniting us and for making us one in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Thank you, Leon. Okay. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Sarah Hummel. I'm the president of Seapoint College, and I will talk to you a little bit more about that uh, towards the end of the program. Uh, we have been working hard to put together a lecture series for you, and as uh, Pastor Kevin mentioned, tonight is the first one. I'd love for you to check out our social media and our website, Seapoint College, to see the other topics that we'll be talking about. You might have seen one of these on the table. See that? We have biblical diversity tonight. Parenting and co-parenting is September 6th. Human trafficking in Hampton Roads, October 1st. Biblical Leadership and Followership, October 11th, and then Marketplace Ministry, October 15th. And these are in different locations throughout Hampton Roads with different panelists. But we just thought, what are some really great topics that will be helpful for us in our Christian walk as we lead and love through what God has called us to do? And that's why we put these together. But tonight... We are going to be talking about biblical diversity. This is one of the guiding principles of Seapoint College. And I am just so honored to get to come together with some of my friends and talk about this topic. We are just going to be living room style with some people who have been sort of walking this journey for a while. And we pray that this is a practical application type of talk for you. I'm going to introduce our host, an expert on this, and then uh, we'll call the rest of the panelists up. So Dr. Anapas Harris is a scholar practitioner. He has nearly 20 years experience as a university professor in several schools. He has served as faculty and in administrative roles and held a lecture chair at North Central University in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he was the founding president and dean of Jake's, Universe, Jake's Divinity School in Dallas, Texas. He is also the founder and president CEO of the Urban Renewal Center. It's located in Norfolk, Virginia, and it's a center for moral thought, voice, and action. They engage in research, social advocacy, organizational consulting, and community engagement. The agency advances principles and practices of diversity, equity, and inclusion for common good through the fusion of cultural competence and the ongoing process of cultural humility. His background is in visionary and administrative leadership within the church, 
in higher education and in local and national publics. He's passionate about the relevance and role of faith in the public square. And his work aims to advance what Josiah Royce and Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community. Central to his work has been academic research, building partnerships with unlikely community partners, crossing racial, ethnic, gender, class, denominational, and religious lines, and leading community engagement programs, building a lifelong learning community, planning special events, starting initiatives to advance best precepts of faith to effectuate positive change in the world. So there are some great uh, hands-on practical things that he's doing. Uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Anapas Harris. Can you give him mic? You have your mic? All right. Thank you for being with us. What an honor. All right, can we get the rest of our panelists up here? Dr. Jameda Robinson, legend, Pastor Kevin Trimper. <laughs> I'm a five. Do you just <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we give Dr. Hummel a great big round of applause for the amazing work she's doing at Sea Point College and um, just a wonderful vision that you have and, and for the vision of bringing us together for tonight's conversation. This is very important. And thank you for the privilege of being a part of the conversation. Now, I want to start with a question to each of you. Um, what do you do and why do you care? All right, well, I have just started a new college, and that's what I do now, is run Seapoint uh, College. Uh, I care because I have always loved diversity. My parents had diverse friendships my whole life. We, we grew in a, a multicultural environment, and so I valued the diverse thought, I valued the diverse people around me, but it wasn't until 2020 that I recognized that real prejudice was happening to the level of oppression for people. And I started recognizing that things had to be different because people were still feeling oppressed and experiencing oppression. And I spent a lot of time sitting at the feet in that year of your work and Legend's work and Dr. Robinson, who is a good friend of mine, uh, my friend Pastor, D Pastor Dana Williams, who was a uh, put on a Be the Bridge group, and she had a group of women of color who graciously gave their time, and I just, again, just sat at their feet and listened for about a year. And learned about what I can do to make a difference. Because I see such a value in diversity, I wanted to help create, and I still want to help create an understanding of how do we achieve it, and how do we, as Christians especially, prevent oppression from happening. Wow. Um, well, I am Dr. Jameda Robinson, and I currently work at EVMS. I oversee the curriculum for the MB program. Thank you. Um, and why is this topic so important uh, for me with my background in psychology? Um, I really like to dig into people's frameworks. You know, I think that's the first step, understanding how people are interpreting the information that they're receiving um, and understanding their own social awareness and, you know, helping people develop better um, emotional intelligence around this. And so kind of the interpersonal work that you need to do to be able to have a good, um, mature intellectual conversation around this topic. Uh, Pastor Kevin Trimper here at Crossroads. Um, I think this this matters to me in particular because, um, again, um, as a pastor, but even my, my worldview or my, my theology is one that um, celebrates the diversity of God's creation. Um, and in my experience, personal experience, um, I tend to fear 
diversity. I tend to fear things that are different or unknown um, because it makes you uncomfortable. It doesn't make, doesn't kind of fit always in your boxes of what you want or what you've experienced. And, um, and so I think for me, this is a really important conversation because it's, uh, I think it really is at the heart of God, that God cares deeply um, that the body of Christ is diverse. It is a, a, it is, it is not monolithic in, in the way that it represents itself. Um, and so I think being part of the kingdom of God is about embracing and celebrating the diversity of God's creation and his heart to see that manifest itself on earth as it is in heaven. Nice. What's up, everybody? How you doing? Hey, Kevin fears diversity. He's sitting in between two black folks. You all right? You good? Like an Oreo. <laughs> It didn't take long for it to spiral down here. I'm sorry, sir. I am sorry. Uh, I, <laughs> my name is Legend. Uh, I'm a rap artist. I'm one of the preachers here at Crossroads. I'm a speaker. I founded a few organizations, anti-human trafficking organization called Safe House Project and uh, Hampton uh, Roads uh, uh, Reconciliation that we worked on together here in the area and uh, City Collective, excuse me. And so, um, I mean, I, I, theologically, it's page one of scripture that the, fr the framework is set for everyone made in God's image, equal value, dignity, worth is right there. And then we have, everything comes from that. And when we lose sight of that, everything falls apart and we see what's happening. Um, practically, man, I was just raised in a neighborhood that was split along the lines of segregation. So it's, it's a historical landmark right now. But the, labor the neighborhood I grew up in, it was, there were chains to prevent my mother from going over into the, the white side. So when I grew up, that was gone, but there was still those houses passed down, so there was still a white side and a black side. And I just grew up seeing that. And I was like, oh, well, I'm glad that's over. And, and as you go in line, and my, my parents and uh, my mom and my grandparents taught me uh, the word of God. They taught me never to live with a chip on your shoulder and all that, but they also taught me the ugliness of life. Um, so I'm wrestling with what they went through. I'm wrestling with what I'm seeing. And then I start to experience things myself that let me know, oh, this, this isn't over. Uh, and so just I started to get passionate about how do we continue to push, push this evil back, even if we never get rid of it? How do we push it back further? And the only answer I see is the word of God So uh, and the practical application of that. So that's why I'm passionate about it. Wow. Uh, so I think you, you made a great segue to the next question when you said that your mom uh, grew up with the fence and then the fence was gone, but it was sort of an invisible fence. Glad the fence is gone. But you seem to suggest that there still is division, although the physical fence is gone. So from your perspective, how would you assess the division we are living in right now in that we don't have the fences? I mean, I can give a practical example from yeah. that too. Yeah. Like we, you know, stuff starts to bubble up here and there and you just, you, you learn, like Sarah graciously said, like a lot of, a lot of my white friends 20, you know, Trayvon and on in 2020 and on were like, what's going on? Like, and these are conversations we were having the whole time. Uh, so it wasn't new. It was just in our face. And, um, but I remember, uh, what was it? It was a hurricane, Isabel, Matthew, the one that knocked out the power for like two, Isabel. So I remember sitting there, Isabel comes, tears Virginia Beach up and, and the white side, black side. And I remember three days later, I'm looking across and there's lights all across the white side. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's probably just a bad break on the side. We'll be, we'll be up any minute now. Week passes. Two week passes. Three, and I'm like, why is the black side just sitting? Why is, no, why is nobody answering these calls? Why is nobody fit? And I just, and, and I'm, I'm explaining away in my mind, it can't be what it looks like. Um, and this, is, this feels like a dumb example, but I think if, if I take my skepticism off, it's a, it's a symptomatic thing of a bigger thing that's going on. And then other stuff starts to happen, and other examples start to happen, and other issues, and, and two things happen, and this one kid in school gets in trouble, the other one gets off. I'm like, what is happening? And, and so it's just, I, it, I wanted to believe it was over just as much as my white friends wanted to believe that was not a thing. I, wanted, I, I didn't grow up wanting there to be an issue. I don't like talking about racial issues. It's not fun, you know what I'm saying? Um, so that was, that, I think that, when you were asking that question, that was the thing that crept in my mind, like, wait, we still have a fence here? You know what I mean? Because it was literally along the lines of where that fence used to be. And, and that's what made me start thinking different. 
Um, <clears throat> I've grown, grown up in uh, Norfolk my whole life, and one thing you'll see, Norfolk's kind of an old city, and so the way that it's laid out is historic of its uh, history. And so um, train tracks, certain streets divide the city, and, and that's not because of a, a, by accident, that's because of how the city was founded, where um, you'll often have a very nice community, which historically, and still today, may be more white. Um, and then you can literally cross like a train track, you can go across one street, and all of a sudden you're kind of in a different neighborhood. And, and people ask, like, why is that? And in large part, it's because, you know, you had white plantation owners hundreds of years ago uh, who, who were in, 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 the, in these neighborhoods. And then um, the help had to work, live close enough that they could walk to the houses. And so when you drive through the city of Norfolk, you see here we are 100 years, 150, 200 years later. But our city still has tentacles. It still has roots where you see poverty and where you see challenges in some communities, um, it's not just because people are lazy and don't want to work. It's because there's a, um, there's a, a foundation that our, our city, our, our country was laid upon. And the, the fruit that we see today is tied to the roots of what we planted when these communities were formed. Uh, fast forward to a, an example here about eight years ago, um, Nigel was legend was going to do a concert here at Crossroads, and uh, we promoted it like crazy. Um, Largemont is one of those more white, uh, upper class communities here in Norfolk, upper crust <laughs> on Surrey Crest. Um, and and so we we promoted it. We were really excited. We put fly, you know uh, on social media, and um, about two three hours before the before the concert, uh, someone from the city came down and and kind of started pulling things of like, hey, you can't have this event here. Do you have a permit for it? And we're like, you don't need a permit. This is like a ministry of our church. Like, we, we're supporting this. And long story short, we had to go through. We, we ran up the chain. And, and, and what came out of it was this, is that somebody in this community, when they heard and they saw the flyer, they saw the kinds of people who were going to be here, um, that what they had voiced to the city downtown was, um, we don't want those kinds of people in our neighborhood. And so a Christian concert that was going to take place right in here got, got tried to get shut down, tried, but we, you know, we worked it. But that's just, that's just an example of how these things are so deeply rooted and why understanding history is so important to understand the current realities that we live in today. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, if we actually do, like you said, history, I don't think the fences ever came down. I think we just learned different ways to get along um, without, and, and the, it's like somebody put a drape over the fence and said, okay, it's gone. Um, I think what has happened is um, people that were in my grandmother's generation, so that you have perspective, she's 91, um, broke down some barriers. And I think after that, each generation came back and said, they're broken, everything's great, we're doing better, you know, we don't have, you know, blacks and minorities sitting on the back of the bus anymore, um, we don't have to share separate areas. And I think we said, okay, done. And I and didn't really keep going. I, I feel like the, yeah, the line of progress, yeah, that it it's still there in our face and there's work that we have to pick up and that the next generations need to come and fix the next pieces or tear down those parts of that fence and so I think what we're dealing with right now um, is our lack of getting back to the work um, and that we're appalled because we thought it was gone but we've all been kind of living a little bit of a, a lie um, and that I think um, with me and Sarah and our friendship, you know, here we are friends. And it took us to 2020 for us to have a deep conversation about this. You know, we both knew we love each other as friends, but we never thought it was important until then for us to say, 
what roles have we been playing with each other and not discussing with each other what were the intimate pieces of our hearts concerning this topic that we haven't shared. So, you know, for me, I think the wall's still there. I think we just need to continue working together. I, I know that research shows we are emotional beings at our core, and that, that's our first go-to is to operate out of emotions. And so I think the current landscape is people protecting themselves and protecting their emotions instead of getting outside of themselves and getting to know what's going on with the person in front of me. Uh, what's so important to me about the concept of being biblical diversity is that we are supposed to be incorporating God's love into everything that we do. Love is getting out of our own comfort zones and being willing to put ourselves in the shoes of the person in front of us. And so I think we're not doing enough of seeing the person in front of us, recognizing the difficulties that they're facing, and being willing to make some sacrifices to get out of our comfortable lives and look and see what uncomfortable solutions are there, what uncomfortable things can I do, what changes can I help affect, because we can make a difference when we're willing to do that. But it does take sacrifice. It does take some courage. It does take some really complex research and conversation and problem solving. It's not an easy thing to solve, but if we were willing to take the time to get into someone else's shoes and to consider what someone else is going through, then we would be more willing to do the work, I think. Mm. Uh, um, my brain is in literal overload trying to process all the things that you guys said. A lot of rich content there. Um, it seems, though, that we have an unintentional Un unintentionally incubated and maybe even nurturing the race problem, it, particularly in a place like Norfolk, right? Uh, because when we say we've integrated the schools and things like that, and we know what happened, all these private schools were developed, um, and um, lot, most, a lot of them for the sole purposes of separation. Um, originally, it started with race separation, then over time, well, I want my kids to go to a better school, and blah, 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 all kind of reasons. So now we have this unintentional problem where you can literally grow up in Norfolk in a black side of town, go to a public school that is mostly black, like Jay Cox, end up going to Ruffner and then Booker T, graduate, go to HBCU and never have a positive interaction with a white person. You can literally do that, and many of our kids are experiencing that right now. Uh, you can grow up in Larchmont or, say, um, Ghent, go to Williams School, go to um, choose one after that, Norfolk Collegiate, somewhere, never have, and then Nor or Norfolk Academy graduate, and let's just say go to University of South Dakota, <laughs> <laughs> and never have <laughs> a meaningful relationship with a black person. Even if you have interaction with some, for, if there, there are a certain economic status, right? A city official's son or daughter over at Norfolk Academy. So you never have a meaningful relationship with the majority of the distressed community that's disproportionately black. Um, and, and then so you can make a judgment by the masses based on one or two of your black friends, right? And the same vice versa. You can say, do the same thing uh, as a uh, African American. So we have these unintentional incubating of the problem, which is worse than it was because we can, we can incubate this problem and still say, we love everybody. I don't have hate in my heart. I think the world should be diverse. And none of your friends are diverse, but you think that they, I mean, you know, it's, and then there is the assumption that because somebody lives in poverty, that's the definition of what it means to be black. So then the socioeconomic thing becomes, overshadows the ethnic issue. Um, and, uh, and then it creates this stereotype. I mean, I taught at Regent for 10 years. Every year at graduation, I wore a blue yellow robe, and I got congratulated every year for graduating. I mean, it just wasn't in people's mind that you could actually be a tenured professor. You must be graduating because of affirmative action or something. You know how you have to help the blacks. 
<laughs> so, and not only with the whites, but the blacks too, because what happened is it becomes a problem. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same thing too that it can happen even with people like me who graduated, went to certain schools and am of a different sort of socioeconomic status, become disconnected with the community that nurtured me and then start looking through a majority lens and judging my own people in light of, well, you could be like me, you know, you could, you know, they can all be like me and then judge the whole community based on that. And that's the intoxication of success that only makes the problem worse, right? So with that said, you might want to disagree with me, by the way, it's fine. <laughs> but um, the next question is, what should diversity look like in the 2020s? And in, from your perspective, why can't we get there? Where, I mean, you mentioned in your opening, People kind of tired of the conversation. Well, we haven't arrived yet. I don't know what we're tired about, you know, but we kind of exhausted not knowing what to do, right? Because it feels like it's a personal indictment, right? When really it's a structural and systemic indictment. So if it's structural, how, what part do we play in making that better? Well, I think that God has brought us diversity of many things in our lives, right? We have all different colored flowers and we have all different uh, types of situations all around us. We have all different emotions. There's so much diversity. God is so creative and he's created every tribe, tongue, nation. He has given us diversity for a reason. It's a gift mm -hmm. and we are not going to go as far if we are just around each other, someone like us, uh, as we would as if we went along with people who are different from us. And, and research shows that. Mm -hmm. um, I love the work of, I'm an Enneagram 5, if you guys do Enneagram. <laughs> I was telling Anna Paz, I have to have my books. They're, it's like my comfort items. <laughs> uh, but uh, Derwin Gray wrote a great book where he makes an awesome argument um, it's the high definition leader. He makes an awesome argument that uh, Jesus' design for the church was that it was always diverse. And Paul only planted multi-ethnic churches, and he goes on to, to show why. He says that our churches should look like our local high schools, I guess minus the private school options. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, I like his approach, and I like his thought. We should have a lot of diversity in our lives, and we should be working together and using each other's ideas and using each other's experiences to further the kingdom of God mm -hmm. rather than uh, trying to just stay close to people that we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that um, Cuffy and, and Gaze talks about in their research is there are organizations that are bonding organizations and there are organizations that are bridging organizations. And I think one of the ways that we can get to uh, at least put our brains in the gear of uh, intentional diversity is considering our organizations uh, bridging organizations rather than bonding. So a bonding organization is one that brings people together who are similar to each other and bonds them together even more strongly, like, like a club of golfers maybe. A bridging organization is an organization that is intentionally bringing diverse thought, diverse concepts, diverse people together on purpose and working with them to have that intention of using all of these different mindsets and thoughts and experiences to move forward an organization. And that creates a more innovative and successful organization, by the way. So that's just my thought on if we can at least get ourselves in the mind Instead of, I'm a bridging person, I'm not a bonding person, that can help us get to where I think we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to take a different approach. Yeah. I'm, I'm more, I like the word inclusion than diversity. Um, I think when you say I'm inclusive, that means not just me, that means all of us. Um, because People do diversity every day. They go, okay, I got a drop of this, I got a drop of that, drop of this, and then there's no inclusion. Um, 
And so for, for me, I think inclusion is what we should seek because, you know, I'm sure someone says, well, I live in a community and everyone around me looks like myself. And I think if you can just take the time and think about someone else, something as simple as just reading the Bible. I've had conversations with people and I go, did you think about how this would look to someone across the ocean? That this might look a little different. And your stance is based on who you are as American or, you know, if you're black or whatever. And I'm not saying that we don't have forms of interpretation based of our culture. But um, I think when you have a mindset of inclusion, you go, hmm, this might be a little different for someone else. And that it doesn't make it wrong. Um, and so for me, I think if people focus more on inclusion of, you know, how do I include more people? You know, I could be in a boardroom with a group of individuals that are all the same. And if they are not asking the right questions and thinking about other people and thinking about different perspectives, um, you'll lose the richness of what a diversity, diverse room will look like. Um, and I think the difference between, for me, diversity and inclusion is humility. Um, in order for you to step outside of yourself, um, and get someone else's opinion, somebody else's perspective, um, you have to have a level of humidity, humility. So, um, yeah, for me, that's, that's my, my big thing with, you know, let's, let's not try to put all the duckies in the row and make sure that we've got every color in the pack. Let's make sure that we're inclusive in our thinking, period. Yeah, I, I um, feel very similar. I think diversity is also often a false sense of reconciliation um you know take something in the water you know a couple months ago you had very diverse people down at that concert all watching one thing but they they weren't living life together like you can get diversity kind of easily honestly um and diversity doesn't represent conciliation or oneness or reconciliation and often i've seen this happen in churches where you get black and white people in the room, and it's like, whoa, we are multicultural, multi-ethnic. Heaven has come to earth. And um, people still don't know each other. They don't talk to each other. They don't know each other's stories. And so I think we give a, a, a false sense of what God is calling us to. But I do think diversity is part of that pathway. Uh, yeah, it, it's part of like inviting us into that but it's often, I think, the first step, not the last. Like the, I think that's what I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. That it's not, that's not the the goal. It's just diversity, because you can get that actually pretty easily. It's about how do we live as a reconciled people, understanding, listening, hearing, uh, grieving with those who grieve, rejoicing with those who rejoice. And often, what that does mean is, I agree, that's humility. And um, I, and in these conversations, what I've also learned is. Um, I don't have to agree with you to care. Um, me and my wife have been married for over 20 years. If I always had to come to, like, we agree in order for me to care, I don't think we would be married right now because we just see things completely different, me, me and my wife. And then you take that and, and place, like, race and history and culture and all that over there. I may not ever understand, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter my understanding. Now, I should try, and I should listen, and I should enter into those conversations, but um, at the end of the day, it's, it's how do I care and how do I love, even if I don't understand, and even if it doesn't make sense to me from my perspective, because that's all I know as well, but I'm trying to learn and listen and lean in uh, for more. And so um, I do think reconciliation or uh, this like call to living together as a people um, requires us to, to walk hand in hand with people which is much more deeper than being next. It's more than proximity. Um, it actually requires us investing in each other's lives to really know one another. I feel like I'm just going to underscore what you guys have said. I don't want to eat up the time. Um, so, yeah, I agree. You guys are great. You're all smart. It's amazing. Everybody up here uh, to the right, skipping Kevin, is amazing. <laughs> I'll mention one thing. Josiah Royce was a philosopher at Harvard at the turn of the 19th century. 
and he coined the term beloved community. And um, he had a very interesting philosophy of loyalty in which he explained that, um, that we gain greater and deeper knowledge of the individual by being in relationship with the collective. And so, and he lifts this from Pauline text, Paul's understanding of the church. You cannot say to the hand, does not say to the head, I have no need of thee. He was building it on a biblical worldview. And he was saying that that needs to be replicated in the broader way of understanding society. Um, the loyalty to people who are different actually help the, helps us understand who we are. So we gain our individuality by being in relationship with the collective. And it has to be a different collective because that's the only way you can truly know yourself. And so he was the doctor father for W.E.B. Du Bois, who was the first African-American to get his um, PhD from Harvard. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. picked up that same concept and talked about the beloved community. Um, so while you all were talking, I couldn't help but think about um, the reality of affirming someone else's perspective is not giving up your own. It actually affirms our humanity at the same time. At the same time, it helped me understand how same or different I am, which should also be celebrated. Does that make sense? But usually we think about congregating around the same, right? Uh, you know, uh, I'm an introvert. Me too. So now y'all go, all the introverts are going to be on this side of the room. Um, but the reality is that the diversity helps us understand where we belong together. Uh, and and so I just think that's a very powerful thing. And somehow I heard you talk about inclusivity um, with that framework in mind. Um, and then the other thing is, um, it's interesting, not too long ago we had Hub. Remember we were doing Hub, Hands United Building Bridges. Um, someone said that I can understand how Antipas is talking to the Jews, but the Muslims, eh, that's a bit too far. And I said to myself, oh, that's one of those fundamentalist converted, um, conservative Christians, they don't understand. Um, and, and I do think that was the case. But what's interesting is um, I took a picture with a, a very conservative person and someone who's very pro progressive said to a friend of mine, I thought Antipas was more progressive than that. Why do you take a picture like that and put it on social media? And I said to myself, what kind of world have we become? I wasn't taking a picture with a political party. I was taking a picture with a human being. And we tend to define another human person based on their religion, based on their whatever, politics and all, that we lose the ability to affirm another human person um, without clouding it out with all the other stuff. So my, I guess my question about diversity has to do with what role does all that stuff, religion, politics, play in this ability for us to actually uh, affirm human diversity? I, yeah, I was going to tell these stories, and I shut myself up, and then you said it, and it came right back. <laughs> so religion, worldview, um, I want to tell two short stories that, that show humanity using their, their grasp on theology to fight against pervasive, divisive mindsets that are coming against. And my basic thing is the intentionality of really taking the Imago Dei, the image of God, very seriously. Like, everybody's like, all right, cool, that's a Bible verse, but what do we do with it? No, it's, it's thoughts, feelings, actions. You can't do any, if you don't put that framework and make this a part of your core belief system that everybody is made in that image, whether they look like, come from, believe, doesn't matter. The starting place of our conversation and, and engagement is image of God, infinite dignity, value, and worth. I can't disrespect you before we have a conversation. Then, then we'll never get to the boardroom and, and honor each other like Jameda said. So I had, I had two, uh, two, two people. One guy was a friend of mine, he's passed on, uh, so, uh, and we were hanging out. He's a black gentleman, about 15 years my senior, and he says, I'm a Christian, I know this is sin, and I know that I'm wrong. But Dr. Antipasha said, it, I've never had a good interaction with a white man. I've only had poor ones, so I don't trust them, and I don't like them, and I know that I'm in sin, and I know that I'm wrong. I need help because I want to get out of this, but this is my lived experience. What do I do? And this literal conversation we had, and I was like, man, you gotta, you gotta you know, meet Kevin, you gotta meet, I started rattling off some friends, but I, I failed to be intentional enough to hook up a coffee. Just say, I just want you to have, have one good relationship. Uh, and he passed on before that happened, and, and, I, and, and that hurt me because 
he was crying out for help at that moment. And he could have done some work on his own, but he was a friend of mine. I was like, I can hook up a coffee right now and just shatter that worldview best I can. Uh, I didn't do that. Um, but he was fighting to get out of that mindset, even though that's where he was. And I respect that. I was preaching on uh, racism at a, at a church in another state, and an older white gentleman approached me after. And he's like, can I talk to you with the real serious look in his face? And he started with the typical, you know what, my, my parents, we, we had black people in the house all the time. I was like, ah, oh, here we go. Like one of these conversations. But he was, but he was being genuine. He was like, we, my, my family raised me, contrary to what I was raised in, to not fall victim to uh, don't deal with those people. They, they we, and he, he gave me all these examples. So I was like, okay, I hear you. I appreciate that. What are you getting to? He says, I run a grocery store where I, if you come in and you can't pay, I give you the groceries. I don't care if you're white, I don't care if you're black. That's just how my parents raised me. He said, and then as stuff started to bubble up these past few years, uh, he said, black kids started coming in and started calling me racist and this, that, and the third. And I'm like, but I've been here for 20 years. Like, why am I a bad guy now? And he genuinely was asking this question. And my heart was going out for him. And one day, some, uh, one, one kid, you know, was, came in, robbed his stuff, yelled some obscenities and ran, a black kid ran out. And he chased him. His friend was waiting outside the door for him to come out. And as he came out the door, the friend punched him, broke his jaw, he fell down. They robbed his stuff and left. And, he, and he's healing up. And he's, he's, he came, the reason he came to me for prayer is he says, I've been raised for 60 years not to have these lines. But culture and this experience, it broke something in me. And I feel myself slipping to the language of the far right about them and they. And he said, and he, and he was tears in his eyes. He's like, I don't want to drift over there. And I'm trying my best, and I feel like a racist just telling you this, but would you pray, what do I do to not go over there and become one of them? Because I want to right now. And that was one of the most honest conversations I've had. And his theology that he was fighting with was saying, don't let go, don't, don't go over there. Stay, keep fighting for the beloved community that your parents taught you to fight for. And he was drifting out. And so what, what, is, what role does religion play? in all of this stuff. If you have a healthy theology and a foundation that says Christ died for all mankind, uh, and everybody, and, and, and it doesn't matter what they were doing while they were yet sinners, you know, Father, forgive them, they don't know what, that's the Christ we serve, willing to give it all for his enemies. If that's our foundation, we have a very difficult time pointing at them and saying them over there aren't worth it. Um, and if you don't believe that, you can do that, and you can slap Jesus' name on it and give him the credit for something he doesn't want. Uh, but I think having the role of religion in that is the intentionality of bridge building and recognizing where we are, recognizing our own unconscious bias, or if we're not and somebody calls us on it, acknowledging it. Um, I think that's the role it plays. You know, um, that's a very, it's time to stop, but now, what time are we supposed to stop? Okay. Well, I feel like it, going to get deeper. <laughs> because um, when you were talking, I couldn't help but think about a, a few things. And that is trying to tease apart all of the nuances, right? Um, did this guy not want to go over there because they were black? Or did he not want to go over there because of a certain lived experience? And, um, and with people who force him into that framework based on their lived experience. Uh, so we have these lived experiences that are competing, right? Uh, a man, you know, I was going, I was looking at houses and all, and I said to myself, I'm going to go over here in the distressed community and maybe find a nice house and be a part of the change. And then when Brother Muhammad's son got shot, I said, nah, I don't think so. I'm not going to do that. Um, I remember when I was in Connecticut, um, a lot of shooting and stuff. I wore a clergy collar every day. People can say, because he was trying to be a preacher. No, I was trying not to be mistaken to be the wrong guy. Because at that time, there was a lot of people, a lot of crime that was in the black community, which was just like here. It just happened to be a distressed community. And it gets all tangled. Because any community with that much poverty, you can be red, it's going to turn like that. So black and poverty get wedded together and get a certain identity that overshadows each other, which is not really the, the case. At any rate, they were black and it was in distress, and I was in the neighborhood, and there was a lot of stray bullets flying and misidentity. So I wore a clergy collar so I can say, I'm not the one, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? So every day I was going in the community afraid 
that fear because I just want to let y'all know that I wasn't the one you're looking for. Um, so you see what I'm saying there? I'm saying that that was a, that's a tension that I live in every day and trying to pull away from the very community that I'm trying to support because it has a lot of stuff going on there that get tangled together. And I think that sometimes when we think black and white, we don't take into consideration all these other nuances that actually weave the problem together and causes it to continue. And then nobody wanna really talk about all the details because you know, it just gets too confusing. But to that point, I wanted to even shout out Cheryl because she helped me tremendously. We, Kevin and I have been talking about this stuff forever, which is why our, our relationship was formed on like having these conversations from the jump. Um, way before, I feel like Trayvon kicked off a lot of stuff in our country. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. And I had people say, hey, that's cool about white and black, but what about, what about my experience? Brown, da, da, da. And uh, one day, I, I don't know, I made, some, I made some dumb joke. Like I was, I was saying something about, Trump said, uh, you know, Kung, uh, what do you say, Kung, Kung flu or whatever like that. And I was like, I was like, man, you know, this, this, you know, he, if you love him or hate him, he's good for a tweet. I said something like that. And Cheryl was like, have you ever taken, with all the talks you're doing, have you ever taken into account how that impacts me from my perspective from the East? And I was like, never crossed my mind, not one time. And she helped me that day. That's, that com I heard that conversation stuck with me because that's my sister, right? And I was like, wow. So like, even with all the stuff I thought I knew with all these conversations and panels, I still had blinders on to another nuance and another lived experience mm -hmm. that she opened up for me that day. Mm -hmm. And um, we, just, we just have to be intentional with keep learning and growing. Yeah. So. Okay, um, we're gonna open up for the audience to have questions. Yes? She is right there. Yes, the unknown gentleman in the front yes. row. Um, <laughs> my question is for Dr. Harris. Um, how, what, how do you see the media, especially the news media, um, contributing to the healing or actually not invested at all in it, the healing of uh, racial tensions in the country? Oh, that's a great question. That's a really great question. I think because there's been these political overlays and there's always an agenda um, that that's sort of an undercurrent that really is at play, it makes, it can actually make it worse. It can actually make the race uh, question worse. Um, and I think that um, another piece is we created these categories for conversation. It makes it very difficult to have the conversation for fear you may say the wrong thing. And Bishop T.D. Jakes um, really said something to me one day that really changed my mind about this. Because I was slipping into that too. what they say? How did they say it? Or what they really mean? And he was like, well, if you're going to coach the conversation on how somebody's going to talk, they'll never be able to, you never get the conversation going. You got you to gotta say it wrong, and it's going to be sloppy, and, you gotta, and we just got to stay in it together and give each other the benefit of the doubt, even if you say it the wrong way, right? So I think part of what we have in the media is created these these categories of conversation. What does it mean to be woke, right? right. You know, what is cancel culture? Now, well, I don't want to be, uh, you know, I don't want to be unwoke. You know, I don't want to be, so all of a sudden, you don't even know what to say, because they've now framed the conversation of what you're allowed to say. So then it makes it difficult to have a genuine, authentic conversation, or as you put it, biblical diversity in which you actually embrace and understand and affirm the other. This is, I say this too, this is not really new. I mean, we see it playing out in the Bible when Peter is the one who um, said, now I know that God does not have a respect of person. And he was the main one who was sitting there when Paul, eating with the Gentile when Paul shows up, and then he gets up, right? Because it's one thing to have it in your head, another thing to have a um, transformed, lived behavior. And, uh, and it takes time and a lot of messiness. And I think that we can find good place in Scripture with a person like Peter and others who struggled to live out what they knew to be true. I, I want to add to that. Um, I think one of the things that we have to remember is like, you know, God says, you know, we're in this world and not of this world. And I think we've allowed ourselves to put all these different name tags on ourselves. 
And really, we should not be moving the same way the world is moving. They should be looking to us on how to move. But I think uh, we've gotten comfortable, and hopefully I'm not stepping on any toes, but you know, we've turned into membership Christians. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, and, and, it's, and it's like, okay, check, I pay my tithes, check, I go to church, check, you know, I, I did my affirmations today. Um, and, and then, you know, check based on whatever beliefs of politics that I believe in and I'm doing the right thing. And I think if we really line up a lot of the things that we would label ourselves and apply it to the word and say, now does God, when I die and get in front of him, will he say, why weren't you a Republican or a Democrat? <laughs> you know? Um, and so for us, I think we've allowed ourselves to be attached to the world's titles that they put on themselves and that we only have one title. We only have one good title that God actually cares about, which is being a child of God. And anything other than that are optional or we should put in front and put it on the altar and ask God, do you want me to affiliate with this? Do you want me to identify myself this way? Uh, which, you know, hence the reason why you probably got the response when someone looked, because you hit someone's identification. They go, mm -hmm. oh, you're not, you're not identifying with me anymore when instead of just saying, look at this great opportunity for this man of God to be able to connect with this individual, um, you hit that person's titles, you know, like a chain of, of multiple titles that we put on ourselves instead of the number one title that as Christians that we should carry. So... Takeaways, don't pay tithes, don't watch the news. All right. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> hey, y'all. Um, question, how do you... Uh, um, this is, first of all, this is awesome. Great great conversation. Um, a great thought to wondering, uh, a lot of what we're saying is, hey, we got to have this idea of biblical diversity. Um, now, how do we... How would you speak to the person or to the group of people who feel somewhat disillusioned uh, or have lost some of the, the steam? And we talked about it earlier, the idea of uh, engaging some of the exhaustion, that there's some work that you're, you're doing and a part of the conversation is not new, but it's, it's, it's exhausting because in every room you're, you're now having to hold up this uh, banner or that banner. Um, and I would say just quite personally, like being in a diverse church, right? Like literally pastoring in a diverse church where when, when 2020 happened, um, we had people that were on both sides uh, and, and the other side and, and now trying to pastor those folks through all of those things. I, I wonder, um, as I think about my own uh, journey, I wonder what we would say to those folks because I've felt that at times that are just somewhat disillusioned, not just with the conversation of reconciliation, but also at times even disillusioned with uh, their faith as, as, a, as a pastor where you're like, this has been one of the most grueling uh, last couple of years at pastoring a church, right? And, and so how do, you, how do you speak to that? Well, this is why I went back to school to get my doctorate in ecclesial leadership because of this very issue. Um, you know, at the end of the day, all of these things are issues that fall under the blood of Jesus and our relationship with him. Like first and foremost, Imago Dei, we are God's creation made in his image with a call and a purpose on our lives. And so we can never neglect that number one relationship. And I think when we start seeing the need and seeing the hurt and wanting to help, and we start doing it in our own strength, we will get exhausted and burned out. And I think that's what the enemy would love for us to do. He would love for us to get so caught up in the right thing and so busy doing the right thing that we can't do it anymore. So I am incredibly passionate about spiritual disciplines, spiritual practice, spiritual formation. We must be in prayer. We must be regularly fasting. We must be seeking God because he will give us strength to do what he has called us to do. And he will speak to us and give us the understanding of when we are to speak, 
when we are to be silent, when we are to empower someone, when we are to notice the person in front of us. At the end of the day, it is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Are you doing those things? I can tell you this is why I really like what Dr. Hummel is doing even in this conversation, and it's because um, that, that what we experienced a few years ago is going to happen again. All right. I'm not trying to be a prophet and all that, neither am I a conspiracist. It's going to happen again well, well, because it's, it hasn't, had, nothing has changed. And it's been happening. It just hadn't caught on to national attention. George Floyd as if he's the only one who was killed by the police. Um, that's, not, that's not the case. It's going to happen again. Um, so, but the reason why I like what Dr. Homo is doing is because she's doing it at a time that it's not sexy to do it. Um, it's not sexy, if you know what I mean. It's like um, this is the in-between, the silence before the storm. And you always know the people who are really vested when they can remain committed when it's not sexy to be committed. And that makes you a leader when it actually happens again because you've been doing it all, you've been having these conversations all along. Then all of a sudden the world want to talk about reconciliation or all this stuff. Um, and I think that the church has to be out front because usually we follow behind what they're doing. Uh, but if we lead in it, I think that we can make a bigger difference. Connected to that, I just endorsed a book uh, last night that's coming out. Craig Ephraim, you guys familiar with Craig Ephraim? I think that's, you, yes. Yeah, he's got another book coming. What's that? Yeah, yeah. So now he's, um, he and one of his co-writers are writing a book, and it's coming out on IVP. Um, in the book, I had the privilege of looking at it before it comes out. But um, not to steal his thunder, but what they have done is collected research that shows that the, this generation uh, uh, is becoming disillusioned with um, churches. And even today, uh, when, I, when I go places to preach and I tell some of the older people in my family, yeah, I was out in Missouri the last, last weekend preaching, and said, they inevitably, you know what the question is going to be? White church or black church? <laughs> If I call them tonight and say, yeah, I was at a church tonight, they're going to say, white church, black church, <laughs> because they know I flew in all these neighborhoods. So they always ask that question, non I mean, every single time. This generation is disillusioned with that. And the notion that it's a white church and a black church has become a stumbling block to the evangel. And, and this generation is running away from that. They don't want a black church. They don't want a white church. Not because they don't want the conversation, but they don't want this to be defined by color like that. Now, that's a gift and a curse. The curse, the gift is the obvious. We need to overcome that. But the, the curse is many times it becomes um, we just not going to talk about differences because we just all in it together. So then we all, that's another way of re uh, doubling down on the problem. So to do this is what we need, right? I was going to say the same thing. The um, season that we're in right now I think is this is one of the hardest seasons mm -hmm. because people don't want to talk. No. Um, Nigel and I have been leading initiatives for six, seven years, and um, there's been the, the kind of the roller coaster, and this is kind of like the dip where it's silence. Yeah. And and um, partly, like, I mean, it could be a lot of reasons for attendance tonight, but I also think people are fatigued. People are tired. People, and people have come to their conclusions. And people are not as open right now to listen. Um, it always, I was always kind of like confused when we entered in these conversations and um, thinking, and I would, well, not confused, I would say I was naive because I came into this conversation thinking, well, duh, like God wants reconciliation. Like this should be easy. And, and, and that was really my posture coming into it. Like we're going we're gonna to see God do this in our generation, and God's got to do a new work right now. And I remember as we would talk with a lot of uh, older African-American pastors and invite them into conversations that we were having now, um, it was a lot of, uh, no, nah, we're all right. <laughs> I'm like, no, like, like this is God's heart. This is what he wants. He wants us to be reconciled. Like, come on in. And they're just like, nah, you're just a naive white guy. Um, and and I didn't, I was kind of, I was really frustrated. Um, like, why wouldn't, why won't you come to the table? Why won't you? And, I, and then I had the perspective, they've been at the table this entire time. And they're, and they're tired. 
And they're over the conversation, and, and they, there's a little bit of disbelief about if anything will ever really change, and if ever, anything will ever really be different. And they've lived through much more than I, and they've seen more progress than I, I've seen in my life, right? And yet there's this like disillusionment of, is this worth fighting for? Um, we got into the space after Philando Castile and Alton Sterling, and we kind of started getting leaders together. We, I mean, this room, this room, we would have 50 leaders in here having this conversation. And um, if we invited pastors today, we might have five or six, you know, um, because it's, it's, it's hard. It's not easy. It's going to cost something. Um, but I do think we have to be reminded of Galatians. Do not grow weary in doing good. They're, like this is the season we're in, and I, I actually believe like exactly what you said when, when the um, George Floyd happened. Um, Nigel and I at that point were able to use the capital from conversations that we had had for two or three years to within a week pull together you know a march downtown with five thousand people at it, and that was only the only reason that happened is because those conversations were we we had the relationships and the conversation had been going on for years. And so it was a moment where we were able to cash in on those relationships to be able to, to do something kind of publicly. And um, as much as I loved that day and the, the march, um, again, that, that, wasn't, that was just a, a, a piece of the, the journey. And it's actually, the hard work is, is in these moments right now. The hard work is when it's quiet and it's not flashy and it's, it's the day in, day out about how you're developing and cultivating diversity in your life, but how you're pursuing God's heart for justice and oneness with his people right now will put you in the place when something pops off again, and you're right, it will. It will happen. Yeah. But you will be, whether you, you will be the person that God can use in that moment to be a bridge. Mm-hmm. You will be the person that will step up and step in and the brokenness, because you've cultivated a heart to lean into God's heart. And, he, and, and this is the season where the planning is taking place, and, a, and you don't see a lot of fruit. But that, that's the kingdom of God. That's how it works. This is a planning season, a toiling season. Um, but, but stay steadfast. Remain faithful. Um, don't grow weary in this, even though you may be frustrated and tired, um, because God's going to produce a harvest. And I, I believe we just have to have a vision of the kingdom of God that is different than the kingdom of this world. And if we put that as a front and center, we kind of keep chasing forward with God's heartbeat, even while we live in the brokenness of this world. All right, well, we should end it here. Can we thank this incredible panel of people? Thank you for being here. Can we give Dr. Sarah Hummel a great big round of applause, the visionary herself. (laughs) Thank you. I'm going to segue into C-Point. You guys are welcome to stay up here or sit down. I would like to point out that what Dr. Harris is doing with the Urban Renewal Center has a lot of great actual research. So if you want to see what is the realities that we're facing right now, his website has really great information. Um, I've spent a lot of time very carefully and intentionally putting Seapoint College together. So we're located on Norview Avenue. We uh, are doing all face-to-face classes. We believe in three main components. Mentorship, so that means all face-to-face classes. Students are being mentored in and out of the classroom. Anti-debt, our students do not get into debt. We have need-based scholarships. Students let us know what they can afford, and they receive a scholarship for the rest. And then personalization. Every student gets an individualized ministry plan that gets updated with them once a year. They are in an internship every single semester with someone who is helping them learn the skill sets that they need to be successful in vocation and in ministry. And we do all of that down the street. We just started uh, this semester. And what I've done as I've intentionally Uh, built the program was put together some guiding principles. So diversity is one of our guiding principles, biblical diversity. So as Dr. Robinson mentioned, it's not about just having a lot of different people. It's about empowering others, seeing the person in front of you, 
looking to see what you can do to lift another person up and pull the best out of them because the person in front of you is a child of God. They have their own experiences. They have their own thoughts. They've been educated in different ways. If you haven't learned something from that person in front of you, then you haven't been patient enough, been humble enough, sat long enough to listen. You haven't drawn it out of them. People should be discovered. And so I like to take the time to discover what someone is about. Uh, community is another one of our core values. Biblical uh, discipleship is another one of our core values. These are the things that we're instilling into our students every single semester. Uh, we are operated on the limited tuition that students can pay and also through donations. I would love if you would consider becoming a monthly donor to Seapoint College or even just give one time. And I'd also love for you to consider if you know someone or are someone who would be interested in joining our program. Our program already started for the fall semester, but we are now taking applications for the spring semester. And I'd just love to highlight one class that we're offering, which is cross-cultural leadership. And we use this book by Paula Caligiri called Build Your Cultural Agility. And this is a book that you all can practically order yourselves right now and start reading if you're looking for ways that you can increase your cultural ability and build up your uh, multicultural lifestyle. Uh, she also has an organization called My Guide, M-Y-G-I-I-D-E. It's two eyes so that you'll see eye to eye. It's very clever. But she has these different uh, uh, activities that you go through to build your cultural agility. And so this is one of the textbooks in our class. And of course, since it's face-to-face, -face, we have conversations with each other and we get to know each other. But she really gets into um, being tolerant of ambiguity. So building up your ability to be okay with not knowing what's gonna happen next, not knowing the person in front of you, but still being comfortable with them. Uh, curiosity, instead of, oh, you're different, I'm afraid of you. You're different, I'm interested to know what do you know? Uh, resilience to cope with difficulties instead of just shutting down, understanding that I can stand up and try again and it's gonna take time. Just like uh, Dr. Harris was saying, we have these boxes that we go in and we don't wanna go outside the box. If you have resilience, then it's okay that we misstep. It's okay that I say a word that makes you, uh, you know, shrink a little bit because we're gonna keep working through this together. Uh, humility being willing to understand that I'm not better than you and you have something to teach me regardless of who you are. And relationship building across cultures. How many, uh, what is, what are your, what does your friends look like? What does your table look like at your home? Are you building intentional relationships with people who are different from you and, and bringing that around your family? And then perspective taking. Can you empathize with someone else? Can you look at things from their perspective? These are things that we talk about in the cross-cultural leadership class, and that's just one of the courses that we offer at Seapoint College. So again, uh, that postcard on your seat, it has a QR code. If you would pull that out and scan the code, you will get a link to see our classes, you can apply, you can donate, and you can also click events to see the different topics for uh, the rest of the series. If you've enjoyed the series, I can guarantee you'll enjoy every other of our series. So I will, well, I was going to pray, but would you pray for us? Sure. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be together and have an important conversation we thank you for Dr. Sarah Hummel and her vision at Seapoint College. We thank you for Crossroads Church and Pastor Kevin. Lord, I pray that you will continue to bless uh, him and Nigel and uh, Dr. Robinson. And I pray for each person who has come together tonight uh, to have this important conversation, to participate in listening to uh, the conversation and also to support this important vision and I pray, God, that you bless this vision, cause it to multiply, bring the students, please bring the financial resources and the human resources that are needed to make this vision come to pass in its fruition. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.